go. Yeah, I'm consenting to that. So if everybody, if you get the question, please give your consent. <laughs> so how can we see that it's recording? Yeah, oh yeah, top left corner, a red little lamp is blinking. So it's recording now. Thank you so much, uh, Karen. We really do appreciate that. Mm. Technology, you know, it's... Um, <laughs> I can't believe we rely on that so much. Now I'm going to share my screen again. Let's hope the recording doesn't stop. Uh, and let's hope I get the correct screen to do it. All right, so we're going to talk about fonts. And and um, and maybe first, uh, formally, I should uh, wish you all welcome to the monthly uh, Austin and Adobe User Group meeting, which uh, has been for a while only been held uh, virtually. So we're here on Zoom, and um, my name is Tom Birdley. I'm doing the presentation that for the uh, September meeting. And uh, this is meant to be, or the idea here is to talk a little bit about fonts and typefaces and, and um, well, scripts and letters and characters and, you know, typography and all that has to do with how we style the letters and the characters that surround us. Um, uh, all the time at this point. And um, uh, this could easily become the first installment of several episodes about fonts because it, 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 because it is a huge uh, topic. And um, I mean, there's probably, uh, there's endless of tasks, uh, I mean, uh, topics and subtopics and, and things we can talk about here. But this is like, this is just meant more or less like an introduction. I'm gonna talk a little about fonts, history, the history of fonts, technologies that uh, have been used and are still being used uh, when it comes to uh, creating and displaying fonts. And, and of course, we're gonna uh, take a look at some of the Adobe uh, software packages, uh, uh, probably mainly uh, Photoshop and, uh, and InDesign in this context just to see a little bit about how fonts are handled in those programs. So this is um, this is kind of a primer. This is a, like an introduction. Uh, believe me, it's an endless, uh, it could be an endless series about fonts. I've tried to be structured and I'm not gonna try, try not to repeat myself um, too much. So um, fabulous faces, font faces and how to find them. Uh, I'm not sure what you're thinking about about what your expectations are and what what your thoughts are, but um, uh, I'm 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 very engaged in this. You know, I've been working with with type and and, and you know visual presentation of textual information for so many years. Um, so um, and I digress easily. So if you have a question, please ask them. Um, and and I will just just go on. But the multitude of fonts or typefaces is one of the things that amazes me amazes me the most. Um, and, uh, and, and, and one thing that we are gonna talk about um, and probably return to several times is, you know, how can I pick the right one? Why should I pick this font over this font? And what are the differences really? And how can we verbalize? We need a, we need a, a vocabulary, we need names of, on the different types of fonts, the different types of characters, you know, names. We need, we need a vocabulary of the parts of each character. And believe me, uh, every little part of every little character and every little design detail probably has uh, names, you know. So, so, um, so um, well, there you go. It's, it's an endless topic. And I want to start, let me start here with, um, uh, let me start here with uh, not the beginning, but pretty far back in history. Okay, so uh, one of the amazing. So, uh, I mean, like I said, we can do this as very conversational if you want. So, if if you want to want to voice any kind of quest, question or comment, I'm I'm, I'm I really do appreciate. It. So just just unmute your you know your microphone and start talking if you, if you, if you feel like it, you know, so, 
and uh, and I'm not a more expert than you know I'm and, and I'm old enough to say if I get a question I, I I'm old enough now to say I don't know if I don't know the answers <laughs> so so uh, there you go but I, I'm totally amazed and I was sitting here earlier this week uh, uh, planning for the presentation and I, and I wonder how how far back should I go for, you know for the beginning and this is. This is really the Roman times. This is around year zero. This is uh, probably less than a hundred years after, um, uh, you know, what we, you know, after our, our, you know, time system started. And it is amazing. Uh, and these are actual coins from that time when the old Romans were using them. Isn't it incredible that we can actually read this? And uh, it says that Constantinus Caesar. So it's the it's the Kaiser or Caesar or Constantinus uh, or Constantine who had these uh, coins uh, created, and those letters are not very different from from our current alphabet, and, and that is mostly used today. And it and it's incredible, and and I'm sure you will know um, what fonts I'm trying to have you think about here or associate uh, with this and it might easily be the the most used font face in modern times maybe it's pivoting a little bit these days because there are so many fabulous fonts available uh, all around us but of course you know the uh, very famous uh, English font designed for the English times uh, more than 100 years ago it was called Times New Roman, you know, Times New Roman, based on these fonts, you know, but based on these uh, letters that uh, were created uh, in the Latin alphabet um, uh, about 2000 years ago. It's, I think that is totally amazing. So um, we're going to move on here a little bit. And I'm, I, I was thinking one place to start, I mean, another place to start, a different place to start is uh, here. This is in Egypt, across the Mediterranean from, um, from Italy and Rome. Uh, this is Alexandria. Uh, uh, on the, uh, you know the, uh, the Nile Delta there, uh, north uh, part of Egypt on the Mediterranean coast. Uh, they, uh, not many years ago, they, they started, they built this new library. And uh, the Library of Alexandria in Egypt is uh, famous because it's, it's been a library there for more than 2,000 years. And it was ruined uh, about 2,000 years. And, and of course, they, people have been speculating where did all the books go, where the scrolls, where did all the scripts go, and, and did we lose all of it or, or were, were some of it uh, salvaged? And, and that, that's, a, that's an ongoing story if you want to read up about it. But, um, so my, my keyword here at the bottom right is uh, Hypatia, uh, honoring Hypatia because she was a very uh, respected uh, mathematician, astrologist, no astronomer, yeah, astrologist. <laughs> um, I always mix those words up, and I'm sorry, but um, when they actually scientifically look at the stars and planets, you know, not trying to predict our future. Uh, but she was killed, and um, and um, you know, it's a big, big, long story. I'm not going to go there. But 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 if you want to read up on on a 2,000 year old, uh, not just scientific or science uh, conflicts and and research, the kind of thing they did at that point, it's also politics involved. And of course, it's a Roman emperor and um, uh, religious conflicts. And uh, she was probably killed by uh, Christians that were not happy with uh, the stuff that this uh, lady was doing. But she, she's, uh, she, I'm going to, I'm going out of presentation mode here just so I can zoom in a little bit here on the back facade of the new modern uh, and very famous uh, library of Alexandria. Uh, because, well, one thing is, and with all kinds of modesty uh the whole library was designed by a norwegian uh architect company called snow 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 snowhead 
means a snow cap is named after a, and uh, its company is named after a, what they call the uh, uh, glacier, you know, uh, called snow happen. But anyway, uh, on this, so it's slanting is a very interesting uh, design. It's like slanting, but this is like the tall part of it, the back side of it, and, and they decided they wanted to on the facade here they wanted to if they could they wanted to collect as many scripts as possible from the whole world so carved in rock here is uh probably not every script in the world and world history but an incredible amount uh from all kinds of cultures and all kinds of um uh you know, parts of the world, uh, small nations, small, obscure. Uh, of course, some of them we do recognize. Some of them are more, you know, more like just interesting shapes that don't really, uh, maybe not even mean so much uh, to us now. But, but I, I think this is so cool because this is all about what today's topic is. You know, fonts or the visual representation of contents you know thoughts and that conveying that from one person to another and saving information from for uh, posterity and uh i'm not I'm gonna spend too much time here i don't know all of these uh, of course I, I don't know most of them i don't know anything about but i do think that was a very very interesting aspect of the whole whole design thing you know over here and i heard uh, many years ago um or a few years ago, I'm not, I don't even uh, remember exactly when this um, this uh, library was um, was officially open. But um, but I, I heard a radio program about it was actually a travel program. You know, like they they tip you about cool things to do when you travel here and travel there, and the and the and the radio host just uh, commented on that he had he had personal reach out to the architects when he heard about the, what these people were gonna do and, and tipped them about a few very, very small or obscure or very little known scripts that he wanted them to include. And the whole point was that, yes, they did include those, those uh, <laughs> uh, little, you know, little things as well. So, so this is, this is uh, what we're talking about. I think it's monumental and I think it's, um, it, it's, it's, it's just a, you know, very interesting light on, on our profession, which is basically communicating, right? Communication with words and, and letters and symbols. And there we are. And Hypatia was uh, one of the ladies who uh, were really underrated through uh, history, but, and she was killed for her uh, knowledge, I would say, um, scientific knowledge that was unpopular um it's an interesting story her life and the story of the 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 old library which was actually destroyed before her time but you know whatever they salvaged from the old library was was under her protection when um she was living and doing her research okay i could go on and on so i think i should just uh fast forward here and try to go to my next little slide. And, and uh, I hope you find some of this a little interesting because I'm, I'm, I want to talk uh, a little bit about the background, but we are gonna end, end up in the modern <laughs> times and we are gonna end up uh, with in InDesign and Photoshop and, and take a little look about, you know, what we can do, you know, with, with type today. So here are four uh, examples of four uh, different time periods or eras, if you want. And there's also different types of technology that have been uh, applied to type and fonts uh, over the uh, centuries. Of course, top left is still the the uh, times old Roman, I would say. Um, we can still read it. Uh, even though we may not understand it, we can still uh, decipher the letters. Uh, that's top left. Top right is, um, uh, so that's about 2,000 years old. Um, top right is hand script, handwritten um, 
uh, parchment documents that were reproduced uh, mainly in monasteries over the centuries. This particular one is about uh, year 800, roughly. By the way, uh, <laughs> all of these pictures are from are, are bought or licensed from uh, the Adobe Stock Service. You know that that um, supplies a lot of uh, high high resolution pictures. And I've I've been sitting there. Um, uh, these are uh, uh, evenings <laughs> last couple of weeks and just trying to flipping through all the pictures and and it's an incredible repository of of pictures even even obscure stuff like this and but 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 it's awesome you know so this is um, a handwritten um, script bottom left you might have guessed what what this is about that is the Gutenberg uh, Bible uh, one of them. Uh, this is actually because it's from Adobe Stock. I couldn't find my own pictures uh, because, uh, believe it or not, they do have a sample or one one book here in Austin at the UT for display to the public. Uh, so you can go up there and actually take a look at it. It's in, of course, it's protected in 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 a, in a glass, you know. Mm -mm display there so you can't really flip through the book uh, thank goodness you're not allowed to take pictures so um, I'm not gonna say anything more about that but these this is from the New York one you know that one is actually in New York so it's uh, there's at least a couple of them um, here in the United States so what's the what, what's the significance of this well uh, one inter interesting thing will be the shape of the letters. You know, all these books are actually, I mean, all these, this is all Latin, you know. Um, so, um, but there's a big difference in the way they they the lettering is, is, is done, produced. And of course, the technologies used greatly influence the visual representation of each, each character, each letter. So from carving in rock, it's all top left. It's uh, old caps. It's uh, very much straight lines. Still, you can tell that every every letter has a, a distinguished uh, shape form that uh, has been thought out. You know, it's not random. Now for the handwritten script it's uh, it's beautiful. It's incredibly detailed, and um, I find it difficult to read. Um, possibly because I'm not used to that kind of script and also I don't read Latin, so uh, I can't really, you know, doesn't really help me. Now, of course, Gutenberg, his invention was, um, uh, b b um, of course, loose, like printing. This is not hand script. This is printed with a reusable uh, type that you could could assemble into into each individual lines and then uh, separate them to reuse them again, uh, which is kind of incredible. So each of these letter characters were carved uh, in the mirrored shape in in wood, right? In little wooden pieces, it's quite incredible. And um, and uh, the the point sizes and the uh, the width of each character has been adjusted because uh, which doesn't show here I might actually have that in the um, let me see here that might actually be here you see that is actually uh, the text is actually justified you know it's it's kind of incredible let me see if I can get that yeah you see that the right margin of the text here is actually aligned I should probably have, I would have wanted to show more of this picture, but I, th I think you can see what I'm talking about here now. It's, you see it's aligned here, it's optically aligned. You see, so it, it looks like it's a, a, like a, like a, you know, a justified text, but, but you know, the, um, the, the punctuation is extending a little bit, you know, so it optically will look more correct than it would be if it were math mathematically. And this is relevant because uh, InDesign actually has that feature that you can turn on optically aligned margins if you if you want. Of course, nobody really want knows about that function, but still. All right, yeah, I go <laughs> rambling on here now. Uh, the bottom right is uh, lead type, you know, found uh, from a foundry. 
which is by the original, uh, I mean, the origin of the word font or found, uh, it's because they were uh, created in foundries. I mean, liquid lead uh, poured into molds and, and, and each character, each letter for each type size, each, each font, each, each font size and, and everything will be, will be, will be founded. In, um, in in liquid lead and then reused like this. So, so this is uh, think about all the different the difference of the level of details here and and how different the details are. So, from what we now will call the more mod modern vari variations of the the Gutenberg type is called black black script. You know, when it was used in the German, especially Germany. Uh, uh, first half of the previous century, last century. Uh, and um, when these type, this is Helvetica uh, here in the, in the lead type over here. Um, people were so uh, annoyed when those new, that was the late 1800s and early 1900s where when, when people started to move away from the, the black letter, uh, Types and they wanted something, you know, simpler. And uh, a big controversy because a lot of people said when you remove details from the shape of each letter, they are going to be much more difficult to read because you can't really distinguish anymore a bit one letter from another because there's so few details left. And uh, of course, people call it grotesque because it was terrible. I mean, they, they thought it looked ugly and bad and grotesque. And, and, and that's another word we use for that kind of, of lettering, even today, grotesque, which could be beautiful. And you might have seen that, um, you know, there's a documentary about an hour, hour and a half about this called Helvetica. And that is truly a very interesting story about this font and its use uh, uh, through history and, and uh, all the different uses. So. So there you go. I'm just touching different topics here. Of course, my, my two uh, variations of the letter M, the capital letter M in the middle here, is just to emphasize that, uh, that thing about the details. Now, I'm not sure what the script, what the black letter uh, version to the left, what, what the font is called. It, it, it looks to me like a modern, you know, uh, design of an old type of, of typefaces, but I wouldn't really know. The, the, the one on the right is, um, is actually from a font called Bauhaus, uh, which is not the original Bauhaus fonts that were created in Germany uh, in the um, early part of, of um, the 1900s, uh, but it is based on, it's a modern design created in the 80s based on, in the 1980s, based on those ideas and thoughts that were prominent in the Bauhaus and the, and the, the modernist uh, era era uh, in Europe. It's not, it wasn't only the Germans, you had the similar uh, movements and, uh, and uh, thoughts about simplification of design in Russia and Italy, uh, all over the place basically. But of course the Bauhaus movement uh, or, you know, um, schools in Dessau and in uh, Berlin, and other places in Germany were, were one of the leaders in that area. So keywords here, technology and details. It's, uh, I think this is incredible. It's food for thought. Uh, how, do, how did these scripts uh, who actually more or less tried to express the same contents, the same message and look so different and it's still, uh, for the same purpose. So I, I think this is kind of fascinating. Now, so I'm gonna scroll fast forward here. I'm gonna go to full screen again. So let me try not to uh, say too much about this little, this little um, montage, but you know, the, or collage, this is, um, this is of course closer to our time. <laughs> It's, uh, it's all about different um, typesetting machines that were making it easier to uh, put text together and choose fonts. And, um, and by the way, the term font, if you look at the top right uh, picture here, 
you see little drawers and i'm not sure if you can see i can i can exit uh presentation mode here again and zoom in here so you'll probably be able to see this uh this is uh you see each drawer is is a different font uh and a font originally that it that is like one set of characters that come out of the foundry uh i mean literally so one font was actually limited to one size <laughs> one so and and one drawer so one font was kind of one drawer so you have uh you have the helvetica over here 28 points with 36 point leading uh, and leading is the way you pronounce that word not leading is leading because it, this is lead type that uh, and the leading is actually the extra space you put between the lines to to you know to space the lines a little bit more so that's why that Word it's called uh, pronounced letting, and you see here that it's uh, um, bold. This is German uh, Feta, as far as I can see, which means bold, and um, and um, and so a font is basically not just what we think about today a font, but originally it was actually one size, or one variation, or one typeface. You know, so twenty point uh, bold. Helvetica is one font and 24 point italic Helvetica will be another font because it was simply in a different drawer. And you see the, the picture here that they had uh, all kinds of drawers for all kinds of type and all different. And here's another, of course, uh, more of the same and this uh, is a di totally different typeface. Um, but, uh, but still, that's, that's the way it works. Of course, today we call it um, a font is, is a uh, not limited to one size anymore, of course, because we um, we use these um, the terms about one one, and we call it, we talk about font families. So you know the the the, uh, the normal and the italic and the bold italic and you know all those. Are, it's like usually it's four members minimum in in a font family. Now, other things here that where technology actually. Um, influences the uh, look and feel of the finished printed result. Top left is one of the type setting machines. So whenever you press one of those mechanical uh, keys, uh, one tiny, so this is for body text, right? So a little piece of, 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 <laughs> of founded letters, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll slide down and, and click into that little thing and you can keep on typing and you see you have uppercase on the right hand side and you have lowercase on the left hand side and these blue keys in the middle are um uh different um diacritics and and um and, and and punctuations and stuff like that but anyway so that is uh of course you had to be highly skilled to operate these machines and um uh, and you could, you could, you will have to decide it's going to be, you know, flush left, flush right, or justified text and stuff like that. Think about how you do that with tiny little pieces of, of lead. How, what do you do? You do put little wedges where the word spaces are, you know, so you can actually press down the wedges and, and press them. So you will actually increase the word spaces uh, to make it fit, you know, so fit the, the column width. So you will have, um, have um, you know, um, even margins on both sides. Now, at the bottom, bottom three pictures here are interesting. I found this picture in the middle, which uh, made me um, a little nostalgic because this is very similar to the first uh, type of machine that I actually operated myself. This is, picture is from the 70s and I started probably in the 80s. So this is a little older. This is a CompuGraphic. Uh, uh, I think this, uh, it's not a unisetter that came a little later, but this, it's exactly the layout of the, of the type of machine I was, I was uh, working on when I was um, an apprentice, you know, back in the days. And uh, inside of this machine is a, a little wheel uh, where it's mounted little strips of film with, with all the, Letter, letters in there. Uh, so the principle is the same as over here. You have, you have. This is like a flat, like a frame. But you have, a, you have these um, 
um, uh, you have these little, this black with, with the transparent shape of the letters. And there was light and optics and light in there that could um, uh, uh, expose each letter one at a time. And the wheel would roll around and you, you operated this over here. You have the point sizes here. I'm not, not sure if we can even see the, de the details are not really showing, but you have the point size here. You have to, you know, left, flush left, flush right. It was incredibly, uh, quite a lot of work. And you have to press enter and then that line will be exposed onto the paper uh, thing that you had to develop later, right? And I remember the machine I was operating, also Compographic Unisetter, four version version four um, and uh, it had two sets of films and each set of film could hold only four fonts so you had a total of eight available fonts that you could use at at one time and with a project and there was no graphic you could not see what you were doing because you couldn't see that until <laughs> it came out of the of the processing later you know so it took, and then we had more of these films. So if we wanted to use a special font, we can open it up, take a break and replace one of those films with a different, um, with a different one. So a different set of four fonts. So think about it when it's that much work to switch fonts, you didn't switch fonts too often, you know, which probably our publications benefited from. We, we didn't, you know, you, you didn't mix fonts unnecessary because uh, you, you're stuck with a font family that you had in there. And, and, uh, and, and I'm pretty sure that most of our designers actually yeah, benefit greatly from that. But in comes the computer screens. And, and um, I just chose this one because it, it's, of course, it's got the HTML thing in here. But, but mainly you see the shape of each letter is composed of very rough uh, little pixels. And uh, of course, at that point, at the beginning of the computer era, we we lost a lot of details, you know. And that's why I chose this font. I found this um, I found this font um, online. It's free. It's called um, what is it? What is it called? Of course, I don't remember what it's called. So I can look it up here. Uh, it's called Dot Matrix. <laughs> dot Matrix. That's the that's the name of uh, the font I'm using here. So it's a free true type font that I found online. I'm just searching for, you know, and it reminds me of those um, those uh, punched uh, strips of paper, you know, that came out of the machines here. I, I didn't include that kind of picture, uh, but you know, you you probably know what I'm talking about. But so the technology in the beginning of computers uh, was a big setback for the for the uh, you know for the quality of type and quality of text. So um, let's move on here. I wanna, I, I've been talking about details and let's, let's uh, take a, a look at something where uh, special, very special history in the history of fonts and then history of Europe and then history of um, a lot of things. Uh, so my next slide is actually something that you may or may not remember from uh, back in the days, this is also back in the 80s, I think this thing happened. And you, you, if you're old enough, you might remember, if not, you might still have read about it, but it was the biggest news that year that somebody had discovered the secret personal handwritten diaries of the dictator of the Nazi Germany, uh, you know, era of time war. So that's what the German title of the Storm magazine says, is uh, Hitler's diaries have been discovered. And uh, whether you know this story or not, I'm not gonna dig too much into it, but I like that thing that, I mean, it's relevant to what we're talking about here because we're talking about the details of every letter and the devil's in the details, right? So, and uh, of every character, every letter, so long story short, after some time, of course, the Stern, 
Stern Magazine had this exclusive. I know they sold the rights to one Norwegian magazine. I'm sure the same thing was over here. They, saw, they made a lot of money of publishing this story exclusively, you know, all over the world. And uh, of course it was a hoax. It was, it was fake. It was all, uh, it was all manufactured cleverly, uh, but, but still uh, fake. And me being a, a topographer in, in training, uh, I was very, I was intrigued by the story. I remember when it came out, but, but I was really, I was not proud of not, I, I, th I think I should have, I mean, of course I didn't have the skills to do it, but I, I should have said with one glance that this is fake. You know? <laughs> of course I didn't, I, w I was amazed by the whole story, but what he even got, we got all these books with the Hitler's uh, monogram here, you know, uh, on, on the front. And this is what I put up, up here at the right as well. So what's wrong? What is wrong? What, what are these letters? Well, everybody thought it was A, H, right? A and H. And it, it was, uh, mon all, of, all of diaries were so, I mean, the, the <laughs> were monogrammed like that. But it's not an A and an H, it's an F. <laughs> so, I mean, anybody with a little knowledge of black lettering should, uh, black letter type should see immediately that it cannot be Hitler's diaries because they should be an A. So that's an A. <laughs> so that's an A-H in the same font that was actually used for these fake diaries. So talk about the little details and everybody thought that was, looks like a fabulous, good old fashioned A. Uh, and of course the guy who made the, is it, publicly known his name and everything. I, I, I don't want to go there into all of those details, but he obviously thought he, he found the correct letter. So there you go. So I just wanted to put that in there and uh, I'm not sure if it would have helped <laughs> to con people here uh, if, if he had done this instead. But it's, uh, it's interesting, isn't it? And uh, of course, there, they, there were lots of uh, other proof that, that this was, was fake. You know, the kind of ink used in there, you know, the kind of paper, the kind of, you know, it's, it, it couldn't have lasted long. But it lasted long enough to fool all the major big newspapers in the whole world paid big money to to be able to publish the story exclusively of course they would have to apologize uh, profoundly um but like i said i was kind of annoyed that I, I i didn't look closer at those letters and i should have i should have said it you know i should have said it no that's not an a that's an f <laughs> but i didn't so there we go let's uh meet another person who is a uh, an incredible nice person to have met. I just learned that he passed away last year, unfortunately, um, uh, in the fall of 2020. His name is Ed Bengat. Uh, I had a pleasure of uh, hearing his uh, presentations here in, um, in uh, Berlin. Um, the topography or type conference, actually. There, there are such things as type conferences. And uh, Mr. Bengat here, I'm not sure if you can, yeah, so this is from his presentation, um, in, in, uh, like a keynote presentation. And when he's telling about his, his uh, designs and his, um, you may have heard his last name uh, or encountered it, uh, you know, if, if you're not familiar with the person himself, because he, um, uh, there's a he's he was creating fonts and, and one of them is named after himself so you can you can buy Bengat the font which is an inter interesting font but when he was doing his presentation here and he says and this is in the background on the on the slide here that he's showing this is a big facsimile from from New York Times and he's from New York so I guess it, that's where that's his home what was his hometown but this little cartoon here in the back here is uh, is uh, is what he, he thought was maybe the the closest he ever came to fame, and that's when uh, they had this little uh, cartoon uh, drawing here, little comic strip. It says, "Mr. Benguet, please, the class is waiting." And you see this little kid taking like forever to 
to hand craft the word cat there. On there. So that was uh, incredibly funny for for when I got to learn about him and was lucky enough to meet him back in the, in the days is some 20 years ago, I met him in, um, in Berlin during this uh, conference. Uh, I was amazed to learn that when I started learning the tricks of the trade here, and we had a catalog of maybe 50, 60 fonts that we could use um, at the, at the print shop uh, where I was working. And, um, and I'm not, making it up if I say that at least I learned that at least 80% of those fonts were actually designed by this gentleman so Ed Bengad is a is a legend in the world of modern type right so let me just show you a little bit about what this guy is known for he of course you see here at the Tipo 2000 in Berlin he was some kind of a celebrity and we all got uh, well, I should probably tell you this, that I snuck into this uh, over sold out. I was there as, as a, with press credentials and I, I could sneak in here and there, but uh, it was, you know, about 20 people, um, font designers who want to learn from the master, you know, how to think about fonts and proportions and presentations and stuff. So he was kind of a celebrity. Uh, let me zoom in here a little bit again, uh, because... Uh, he gave us these um, sheets of paper that he's actually signing there. I think that is my, actually might be mine because I got one signed too. So I have it, have it framed on my wall right here where I'm sitting now. And it's about his principles for creating the correct proportions between the, the strokes, the thin and the thick lines of a font and how, to, how, how the principle of creating a good font is. Okay, so uh, it was an amazing, uh, a course like a two-hour crash course in creating fonts i was never uh i would never create fonts but i i would love to learn about it you know and and learn about this person who created all the fonts i was using when i was you know back there in in uh, school so one of the stories he told uh so what he often did was he was hired to create like um um uh, posters for new movies and stuff and that, that it was not just the, um, the the overall design he he also hand lettered all the text on every point every poster right and his story about this movie uh, was that he was offered he, he took the I will I am going to make the poster for the guns of Navarone I'm not sure if you saw the movie it's the war movie from based on the second world war and this and the action is taking place in Greece it's actually a very good movie, and, and as you can see, is a is a, is a, is a bar, you know star packed cast there and everything. But he he told us during his presentation that he was actually he was offered to see the movie so he will get some inspiration to I mean know what it was about when he was going. <laughs> gonna create it and this is and his answer was nah i don't need to do that because i'm an american i know what the navajos are you know so he thought it was about an indian indians so he created this it's kind of the logo for the movie you know the guns of navarone thinking it was about uh american uh, <laughs> uh well that's his own words you know i'm just quoting him it's from the horse's mouth he said he he, he, the guns of Navarone, he thought it was about Navajo Indians, you know, Native Americans. And, uh, but it didn't make any difference. Everybody who saw it and everybody, they thought it was great because they got the Greek or Greek uh, <laughs> associations with the font, right? So, uh, and everybody th thought that was his thought when he created it, but no, it wasn't, you know, so, so uh, I mean, that is cool. Here's a couple of other ones, you know, and think about this. He, every font he created and every poster he created, he, he, he was never working and never did, as far as I know, through his whole life until the end. He'd never used computers. He, everything is hand uh hand design and hand drawing hand writing uh with ink on paper so uh so this is just some some of the other ones but let's um let me see here i want to um, uh, i want to flip over here to my web uh, browser here for a moment and see if i can find um yeah here it is so here's the uh this is the sad news actually 
when um, uh, that news came out uh, last year that he uh, unfortunately passed away at the age of uh, 92. Uh, and if you look at this story, this is from, um, you know, the, the niche of font enthusiast is, is narrow, but it's deep, you know, it's uh, people who are into fonts and font design, font creation, it's a uh, it's, it's it's an incredible amount of information you can you can get and and this is what font is dot com. So I would I didn't even know this pay, this uh, service uh, existed until I started to research research my my um, my presentation here because I wanted to I wanted to see how he was doing and unfortunately I didn't even know he he. Uh, he passed away. So here's a, here's a, this is just one interesting aspect. He you started as a jazz musician and um, he has a, a few ideas about the, 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 uh, the similarities about creating music and creating type. So he has some quotes here, you know, that, so a letter form is like music. It's got to carry a tune, have balance. Music is essentially a, essentially sounds placed together to be pleasing to the ear. Type and letter forms are the same thing, yet for the eye. So that's that's one interesting thing. And and this uh, little you know super cool person, he's uh, and he's got an appearance that uh, little Mel Brooks kind of appearance, you know. So so he's a uh, very outspoken, very vivid, very you know very much fun. So. I'm going to try to play a few minutes, a couple of minutes or one or two minutes from uh, this video. I'm, I'm, I've never done that on a Zoom thing before. So you're supposed to have moving pictures and the sound and everything. And if you don't, please let me know and I'll just move on. But but he, here's a, I've, I've, I've set it here at the time marker. So let's hope it does what it's supposed to do. I think like the first typeface I did was I was going to school at a place called The Workshop. My teacher was a man by the name of John Shadler, and he was teaching the class. And one day he came in with a script. It was called Shadler's Script. It was beautiful. And he showed it to the class, and I went home that night and decided to draw one. It took him a year. I went home at night uh, after uh, deliberation, and I decided to draw one too. So I drew the first script. It took me about three days. It took him three years or whatever. And I took it to photo lettering and showed it to Ed Ronthal, who was the president of photo lettering. And he said, beautiful, we'll take it. Not realizing they take anything. It would make any difference. And I was so proud. I called it after my wife, Norma Script. Uh, and the second one after that was a man, uh, Jay Walter Thompson called me up and he said to me, would you like to design a font for the Ford truck company? And uh, I said, I'd be thrilled. And I named that one after my son called Johnny. They're both ugly. They're both disgustingly ugly. It was really early ugly. And I know from ugly. The fonts that I like, that I've designed, we have to understand that most of the fonts I've designed are like my children. It's like babies or children, they're born. Uh, you like them all, but there's always idiosyncrasies about like children that go on. I don't really like anything I've ever designed. I find fault with everything for that matter. The one I like the very best is the one that uh, was that we put into the ITC library called Ed, you know Bengat, uh, and I like that one the very best. But I still don't. I find idiosyncrasies with it. And like anything else, after it's finished, you always say I should have, I would have, and I could have, but I didn't. You can't go back. Oh yeah, let's do just a couple of minutes. A couple of you know, in designing a font. BC before computers, you just didn't sit down and get it. You had to draw it. And people don't realize the work that it took. Uh, for example, uh, in the latest font that's out there called Ben Gap, that alphabet took about a year and a half to draw. Uh, it's hard to imagine drawing something and uh, we'll, we'll eliminate the computer from the conversation at this point, but drawing something so carefully that you make a letter A and it's finished. Now you've got to have a letter B to go with the letter A. You don't know how wide to make it, how narrow to make it, how to draw it, what tools to use. And it was a hell of a lot of work. All right. That's, um, that's the man. So I hope you, hope you, you got that. Um, we can share the URL. Actually, I can do it in, um, 
Well, I'll have to do it afterwards, but I don't want to waste time on that now. I see time is flying here. So, so that's the man. We might not have heard about him, but uh, we sure have seen and used his fonts. So, uh, so here's another uh, one of his um, uh, things that I really, really found amazing. Uh, you know, watching him think and 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 display his uh, thoughts here. This is one of his, um, actually, I wish I had, if I had stayed behind, I could probably have stolen a few of these, uh, <laughs> these uh, you know, uh, hand drawings that he made here. He started out, by the way, uh, at, the, at the top of here, these little crazy little things at the top. He said, uh, anybody can draw a font, you know, everybody can do it. It's nothing stopping you. You can just create all those letters and put them together. And I, I do have some samples here, actually, that, that, uh, that, is nothing to do with him so it's just like these are just like fonts or alphabets or letters that don't make any sense to me because they, they just decorations you can use them uh, maybe for a logo or something but you know it and it's interesting to see that all these things exist but uh and like these guys you know so so uh, and, and 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 i have nothing to to comment about these guys who make these fonts and put them out there uh, because they might serve a purpose, but but he says anybody can do that, but not anybody can get the proportions right and get get it right when it comes to designing a font. And he's uh, on this poster, the, uh, that little thing that he handed out that he gave us. His his mantra is what is down is down here. The H is the lock and the E is the key. So that's uh, what he teaches his team. And remember, he had a huge team of of, uh, of people working for him. So he, he set out, you know, creating a font and then he, he, he taught his people to, to complete the font and, and use those proportions. And, and I don't remember the details about why he said the, the E is the key, but um, uh, yeah, I, I, I meant actually to go back here, but uh, to this uh, little thing here, but he, he did explain it, you know, how the different, when you, so he always started by designing the capital E because then he could measure based on that uh, and how should, you know, uh, uh, you know, and then he set out to design the, the uh, capital H to, 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 you know, to use those proportions. And, and, and I don't remember all the details, but it was incredibly fun to watch. And here are, Three of his uh, his main main works, you know, the the font he just said is was the only one he liked himself. He's designed more than six hundred fonts, so I'm I'm not even sure if that's true. But so this is the ITC Bengat, and this is the Gothic. So this one does not have the serifs, you know. So so this is another one, and then he is the guy who put those old uh, Bauhaus thoughts together. A lot of Bauhaus. Um, Purists don't like this font because they think it doesn't really honor the intentional, uh, you know, start of the, the the Bauhaus idea of one universal script that should, you know, replace all other fonts. You know, that's the Bauhaus um, uh, way of thinking: is that everything is universal and everything should, um, you know, you could you could if you find the right one, you could. Uh, I do have a picture here, by the way, but I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be running out of time if I'm gonna follow all, all of those thoughts. So I'm, I'm just gonna go back here and and try to complete my little presentation here. Let me see where is the design here, yeah. So, well, what I do wanna do uh, just real quick is that because I've been teaching uh, design for so many years and, and you, uh, this is what I just told you is what I've been using a lot in, in during my, my uh, design classes. And even have design uh, newspaper design students, and I, I I give them a two part lesson. And one is to look at these fonts, try to verbalize what what how would you describe this font to, to, to if if you want to describe it to somebody who can't see it, how are you going to you know think about that vocabulary that you need to use, you know? So, so, and, and, and I had people in little groups discussing and you know, the, 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 the um, diagonal or slanted cross line here in the A and the, and the B opposite ways. If you look at the, um, uh, funny enough, the A is 
it's slanted the opposite way in the Gothic version. But anyway, so well, I, that was incorrect what I said. But uh, but if you if you if you look compare these letters, like the uh, maybe I should use the the uh, uppercase R instead as an example, because if I go over here, uh, you will see that. Um, Oh man, I should zoom out and then again. Maybe I should do like this. You see that these are opposite. You know, this is slanted slightly to the right here, and this is actually opposite. So, so, and then when we had that discussion and they started to memorize what this pond looks like, I give everyone a camera. Or I have my students actually bring a camera, and then I send them out. And this was in Norway, so excuse the language here, but. I send them font spotting in the streets of Oslo, for instance. And here's some of the pictures they came back with, you know. So, the, so forgive me for this is uh, this is Oslo a few years ago, but but still, you see here, the, you see, you see the characteristic of these fonts, you know, and 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 you can spot it almost anywhere, everywhere, you know. It's so incredible how how common this font is and you can start doing your own font spotting later after after we've done this you know i mean when when this is over and you can look for those you, you can do that little exercise for yourself and see what 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 are why it, here is the the pub bar lettering at the bottom and you can um there it is and 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 you can actually start spotting these fonts uh, around you because it is definitely one of the most uh, used fonts in the whole world. Um, so there you go. So I think this is fascinating. I hope you get something out of that. I have um, uh, only a few more, a few couple of more things uh, le uh, left to talk about. But we need to move on to. We need to move on to um, our programs here, you know, the, the software, you know, we're going to talk about a couple of things here and I'm, I'm going to wrap it up in about 10 minutes, I think. So we, we will keep within the 730 time frame that we're supposed to. But let me show you before we go into InDesign and Photoshop, let me go and see if I can find my um, this page. This is on this is fonts dot adobe.com okay fonts dot adobe.com if you subscribe to the creative cloud you will have full access to uh, this service which is uh, an online uh, uh, repository of fonts we can do something fun here we can um, search for Bauhaus for instance and you will see that uh, it shows the there's like a group of, of fonts that they call the hidden treasures of the Bauhaus Dessau, which is incredible. Um, that's that's something you you wouldn't get here. You will find find the font Bauhaus as well eventually. Uh, uh, eventually, but if you search for this gentleman, you will see that he's um, definitely present in the collection himself. Um, and uh, you can purchase that. Well, you don't you really purchase this, you license it. So here you see the font again, and it's available here. You can download it. You see there is a, 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 well, you see the samples here and everything. The, the, the font service that Adobe has put forward is, is actually incredible. So, and, and it's very fun to work with. We, uh, I, uh, so if I put here Adobe, now let me do it. Austin Adobe User Group. We are going to need a new logo soon here. So, one way of getting about it, if you just want to see if you can find a font that you can use to 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 express the name of this thing or anything else. By the way, you can go in here and just type it in, and you can flip through the fonts, and you will see here that that uh, this is a huge family. And you will see the samples, and you can even go up here on the top, and you can you can make it bigger, and you can. Um, well, there you go. So that's that's uh, one of those things you can do in here. I just want to point you in that direction. In a later uh, installment of this uh, series, I hope it can become a series. We can dig deep in here and see exactly how much we can we can do with the Adobe font. And when you click here. If you click here that you want to um, 
on a license set, it gets added to your computer, installed on, on your computer immediately. So you can go ahead and start using it, okay? So that's one thing. So uh, let me switch over to Photoshop real quick. And this is uh, the picture I took. And can you believe it? This was um, about 20 years ago. And I had one of those early Olympus digital cameras and impressed everyone by walking around with a non-film camera at the conference down there. But the downside to that is the resolution of those pictures. You know, So this is the best. This is actually the whole picture. It's like 1,200 by, I don't know, 1,600 pixels or something like that. So that's, uh, that, that's not fun. But you know what? I've tried to enhance that um, that texture just so you should be able to see it over there. But you know, here's um, here's actually what the, what the text is saying. You know, so and uh, and like I said, he was very proud of that thing. Now, uh, the type engine or the the way type is handled, uh, you know, under the hood in all these Adobe programs um, is exactly is actually the same. Um, and there's a story behind that too, and I'm gonna cut it short at this point, but it's, it's the core little piece of software that is the core of InDesign um, that Adobe didn't even know was there when they purchased uh, the other company, you know, Aldous Corporation uh, back in the last century. They wanted PageMaker, you know, to be their third hundred million dollar revenue per year kind of product that wanted that in their portfolio. But hidden in a little drawer was all the research that uh, all this company had been doing on creating a much, much more efficient type engine that, you know, that could, could push fonts or, I mean, type around in the software much faster. And that core is what first was, pub, you know, shown um, as K2, the code name K2, and, and then later become, became InDesign. And over the years, uh, please don't switch back to Firefox, no. So over the years, uh, uh, th that engine was ported over to Illustrator and, and, uh, and Photoshop as well. But Photoshop is a pixel uh, program. So if I zoom in here on my letters, you see that they are displayed as pixels, but the fonts themselves are vector based, right? Because in the shape of every character inside the font is defined by curves and, and mathematical uh, equations that will shape the form. Now, the deal is that whenever you, you, you finalize the text in here, you will see that uh, it will be rendered as pixels anyway. I can still go in here and select this thing and I can I can increase the font size even though it's um, you know even though it's Photoshop, and I can increase it. It says here it says 100 point. Let me do uh, 150 point. You will see that it increases in size and it gets re-rendered at the maximum possible resolution. So it will still be as sharp as it can be. It's only if you zoom in that you will see that that is actually being rendered as pixels. But it, it's, a, it's, it's a thing, it's a good thing. So all the fonts on your system will be, uh, you can use them in, in, um, in, a, uh, in a Photoshop as well as uh, InDesign. Um, but just remember that they will, the edge pixels might be visible. Now the cool clue here is that you can actually decide actually how should they be rendered. And you see the edge pixels of each character is blending into the background. So the edge pixels are semi-transparent and they will blend into the background. Now, since, uh, since that is an issue and depending on what kind of public, I mean, what kind of product you're, you're working, you know, working for at the moment, you can change that to make that edge more crisp or less crisp or, you know, um, uh, it, it definitely work on that. It's, um, a lot of settings uh, that apply to that here inside uh, Photoshop. So with that said, let me fast forward over to InDesign and then we're gonna wrap it up here. So we're not gonna spend as much time in, um, uh, in, in the software as I might've thought, but there will be time for that later, okay? So let me just finish up with the grand finale on the, and how we, 
I'm not saying I'm going to create a new logo for the user group today, but but one technique that I uh, try to teach my students is to how to, if you want to, you know, create a logo or maybe a poster or maybe even a magazine or whatever, you just need to experiment a little quickly about, you know, I want to see this text in, um, we're using different fonts and I wanted to see it like fast. I, I select all these text frames that I have here. The, the, the AAUG, um, uh, you know, initialism there. And then the, the spelled out uh, Austin Adobe user group. You see that it's using two different fonts at this point, but well, let me just do the ones on the left, you know, to get started. So then I open up the type, uh, the character panel. And this is, uh, one of the most fun things I ever do, <laughs> still is, I just open up here, I have the, the text selected and I just, you know, select here at the beginning of the alphabet. Uh, there's a font called 718, 700 and, uh, 718. It is actually true. And then I click in here, I just click to place my cursor or the focus of the program into that font family uh, but menu thing, you know, the field in the, in the care, in the, because, and then I use my arrow keys. I just, I just down arrow inside that box. And you see, I can flip through fonts really, really quick. And I will see that how, and some of them are, the letters are now there. They, you know, there's some, you know, these are emoji fonts that don't really compute, you know, I can go on here. And I can go through the whole list really, really quick. Maybe I should have made these um, text frames a little bit bigger, but you see the deal is that you will get a very unique insight into the thing you're working on. I've been creating a lot of logos using this technique. And, and the deal is that you, when you have a limited amount of text to work with, like, like just the names of an of a, of a organization like this, you, you might see, re yeah, there's the Bauhaus, by the way, one of the Bauhaus uh, renditions, the, the font. But anyway, you, you might see very, very quickly if there's something you like, if there's something that works and something that doesn't work. You know, most of it doesn't work and, you know, this is terrible and you can't really do it. But think about it. You have all the fonts on your system and you can go in here and, I mean, I, that is, that is uh, Badoni, it's a classic Italian old, you know, uh, almost Renaissance kind of uh, 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 characters, you know, letters. But anyway, that's that's my uh, technique. Uh, there, you can build on this, and we we I'm going to show you this in in a later presentation. Uh, and you can do it over here as well with just the, any any amount of selected text, and you can go in here and you can just flip through. Of course, you can open up the menu and and select the font. Uh, how does Adele look, and uh, how does this look, and that look? But you know, the real creative juices get flowing when you just flip through. You flip through like this and you say, uh, oh yeah, that looks interesting. I wanna work with that. You know, you can either make a note real quick about the name of the font. What I do, I just duplicate that text frame and slide it to the side and then I can just go, you know, so I just go here with the move tool and I, oops. That was the wrong key. I, I use the alt key here and I just copy it real quick, you know, and then I go back here and then I just keep going, you know, and see if I can, you know, see something else that interesting. And when I'm done, gone through the whole thing, then I might, you know, I, I have all these samples of stuff that I'm looking for and that I might might want to work, work further on with, you know, to, to complete my thing. So, um, yeah. I, I stumbled over this quote and I think it's really good. But, um, so it, I guess this applies to anything, but, uh, and I was going to play around with fonts for this quote as well. Um, and just show you that if you have different kinds of font, you have this, the, you know, the, the, the regular version over here, you have the italic down here for most font fa families. When you play with it, you will, um, uh, it will still show you the, the italic, you know, and, and the, uh, you know, in, in, in a different font. So, of course, I lost my selection there, but, but I think you get the point. But anyway, if you want to learn about fonts, it's, um, 
I hope I get you started. Uh, I'm going to close my presentation right here. And thank you so much for, for your attention. And um, I hope you got something out of it. Uh, if you have any questions later or comments, I'll be more than happy to to, uh, to, to comply and um, and if you have any you know wishes for things we can you know any you know we can dig deeper into fonts in the future of course I will be very very happy to hear about that so thank you so much and I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna stop the recording um,